I was acutely struck as I was preparing this sermon by the irony of a Patriots fan preaching about suffering to a congregation of Atlantans. <laughs> I came this, uh, this, uh, this Monday, earlier this week, back to Atlanta, flew back to Atlanta, and was getting off of the plane, coming up that little jetway, uh, onto, into the hallway in the airport. And the first thing that I saw coming out into the airport hallway was one of those big advertisement, almost like billboard-sized advertisements in the hallway of the airport for uh, combating human trafficking. And I really struggle on a suffering level with billboards like this because on the one hand, I can't help but think of the tens of thousands of people who walk by these signs and aren't really given a choice about whether they want to think about the, real, the horrible reality of human trafficking in our world and what that means and the suffering that it induces. And I'm sure that no one has ever walked past it who was in the act of trafficking humans and thought to themselves, oh, look at that advertisement. I guess I won't traffic humans. But if there's been even one person who was experiencing human trafficking, who was being trafficked and saw that billboard and got the information that they needed to get help or to get safe, then it is worth it. It is a good thing to have there. And so I struggle with, with the, the, the suffering that that brings uh, into, into our lives and how we know kind of how to respond to it and when it is worth it to be encountered with suffering and to be called to bring our compassion into the world on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to be aware of suffering. We need to know when it's happening in our world. In our reading, the Buddha would not have become who he was if he didn't encounter that suffering in the world. He, if he had just stayed in the, cha in the, in the palace, <coughs> and been sheltered from the idea that old people and sick people and dead people exist in the world, then he'd never have been on the path to becoming the Buddha, to becoming enlightened, to sharing that path to greater compassion in people's lives and in the world with the world. We would have been perhaps deprived of one of the great spiritual pioneers of humanity. On the other hand, it's hard to be constantly inundated with the suffering of the world and to not become cynical, helpless, and despairing to feel, in the, to feel those things. One of the most pervasive myths that we tell ourselves in the face of this bombardment of suffering is that we are helpless to do anything about it because if we encounter it with a sense of our own power and yet still face the reality of that suffering, we're forced to ask, are we evil ourselves if we have power and these things are still happening? Uh, and we feel shame, feelings of shame and fearfulness of that power that we might have. And so we're called to walk a very delicate and important balance when we encounter the suffering of the world. So how do we? encounter it? How do we come to it day in and day out in a way that neither succumbs to a feeling of helplessness and despair, uh, nor becomes so, uh, so open to the woundedness of the world um, that, that we can't, that we're immobilized? And this has to start with ourselves, with a feeling of genuine and heartfelt compassion for, for who we are and how we are. There's a reason that in the embracing meditation each week we say to place your hand on your heart and say, I will love myself, because that is an important and foundational reminder 
none of this capacity for compassion in the world exists or is exercised if we are not first having that capacity for compassion and love for ourselves. For many of us, that's the journey of years and decades and lifetimes just to get to that point of genuinely loving oneself before you even take any steps beyond that of bringing that love and that compassion out into the world. When we have that, the next step is to bring it out into the world only insofar as is genuine, as we are able to actually feel in our hearts and our minds that compassion. There's, there's nothing quite like an election year to remind us what false empathy looks like and how hard it is <laughs> to witness that in our public sphere. We're one of the most common and difficult to avoid stumbling blocks in this process of bringing our full compassionate selves to the world is the temptation to kind of jump a level of saying, you know, I want to be, I wish I were compassionate to X degree, and I'm going to act as though I were. For many of us, perhaps this takes the form of going out and working for social justice causes far from home when in fact there's turmoil in our own lives and in our own homes that, that needs to be addressed first. If we are to go and bring health to, sort, to places in the world that, that need it, then we can't be doing so from a place of unhealth in our own lives and in our own families. How do we know? How do we have a sense kind of of where we are on this path on a day-to-day -day basis? And my suggestion is asking yourself and asking each other the question of how is my heart doing? How is your heart doing? Taking that opportunity to ask yourself, is today one of those days where I'm going to struggle just to get to that place of I will love myself? and I will love those closest to me? Am I gonna to need to grit my teeth and make a real effort just to kind of hold down that baseline? Or is today one of those days when I feel so overflowing with compassion and love for the world that I'm gonna find challenging and new ways for that to express itself, for, that, for me to put that out into the world? It's, it's okay and common and expected to have days where you're at those different levels. I, I ask myself that question and I get very different responses on different days. And it's helpful to know like, all right, you know, this is where I am and, and I'm gonna know that going throughout today, I'm gonna have to try, but I'm gonna make sure that I'm at least at that place of loving myself and loving the people who are close to me. And then sometimes of getting up and saying, I'm gonna take a chance today, I'm gonna to take a shot at bringing sort of this, this good sense of compassion and this good feeling of love that I have in me. And sometimes it'll work and I'll find a new way to connect with the world and bring that compassion out. And some days it'll be, whoops, all right, well, moving on, <laughs> trying something else the next time. <laughs> We need all the help we can muster on this difficult and important journey. That's why we come together in supportive community. Why we remind ourselves of these truths on a weekly basis. This isn't something that you can learn once, that you can maybe do by mo rote memorization and you're good to go, you've got it forever. It's a, it's a part of you no matter what. No, this is something that we need to remind ourselves every day, every week, and that's why we come together in supportive community. And one of the advantages of doing it in a pluralistic supportive community is that we draw on a number of faith traditions in this work. And I think the Buddhist tradition in particular has some very uh, helpful offerings in this particular realm. Edwin Arthur Burt, an influential 20th century scholar of religion, wrote in The Teachings of the Compassionate Buddha, quote, being a philosopher, 
as well as a great spiritual pioneer. Buddha discarded all claims to special revelation and all appeals to authority or tradition. He found his standard of truth and his way of discriminating it from error in the common reason and experience of men as they can be brought to bear on the universal problem of life. This might sound very familiar to us as Unitarian Universalists. This, uh, this idea that the transcendentalists drew on, uh, they looked at Eastern philosophy and coming up with the, the tenets of that philosophy and that theology, and they came to similar conclusions about the standard of truth residing in each person, about each of us having the capacity to make those distinctions between right and wrong, between uh, truth and immorality in our own lives and in the world. This is one of the cornerstones of our democratic faith, is this tradition of saying we trust each person within the context and the help and support of good institutions to be able to know and to make decisions and determinations in their own life and in the world about, uh, about the right way to do things and, and the right way to understand and to act. <clears throat> The essence of Buddha's teaching, Bert writes, can be expressed in the four noble truths, which he translates in the following way. <clears throat> Existence is unhappiness. Unhappiness is caused by selfish craving. Selfish craving can be destroyed, and it can be destroyed by the eightfold path. The eightfold path, in turn, is right understanding, right purpose, right speech, right conduct, right vocation, right effort, right alertness, and right concentration. He's saying there is a path to, well, there is, first of all, suffering in the world, and there is a path, there is a methodology for extinguishing that suffering in our lives and in the world. It starts with understanding an awareness, an acknowledgement of that suffering. It builds on it through a day-to-day -day moral behavior, a commitment to acting and speaking in the right way that in turn reinforces one's capacity for having good concentration and awareness. And those, those buildings of concentration and awareness in turn help us to have right speaking and understanding. And so as you incorporate and as you have those different practices complementing each other, they all grow together and one progresses down this eightfold path. And one of the reasons that having a framework or a path is so important to us in our community in specific is that it helps us in our anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism, Aramac for short, efforts. If we take our efforts at multiculturalism seriously, advice that helps us to say the right things to each other and to be in an understanding relationship with each other when we fail to do so is foundationally important. Right speech begins with not lying, with not putting others down, and Folks who have attended Beloved Conversations and our volunteer training from last month know that we're putting an emphasis on microaggressions, on knowing that there are some things that we might say unintentionally that hurt other people's feelings because of their historical oppressions, because of the oppressions in their own lives, that if someone who, who doesn't have those oppressions might not be aware of, and yet, is still called to have a sense of and to be aware of in committing right speech, in knowing this is something that could be a trigger. This is something that could be harmful to say. And so as we build from that foundation in, for example, right speech of not lying, not intentionally putting others down, we're called to simultaneously develop a sense of right understanding and right awareness 
and compassion and concentration such that in each moment, in each interaction, perhaps we are not perfect, but we are building towards that ability to avoid things like microaggressions, to avoid saying something that even unintentionally will harm another person, being more aware of perhaps the distance between our intent and our impact in our speaking and in how we are in community with each other. In a spiritual community like ours, the privilege is to not only come together and work on those things in worship and in religious exploration, but in social justice work and community building in our social groups and to have it all be part of kind of that, that same package and paradigm and framework of knowing that you are, you are supported and held accountable in this work, sort of no matter what aspect of this community you are interacting with at a given point, no matter where in the life of UUCA you are, uh, this is part of the package. It involves a capacity to be aware of and to know how to respond to suffering on so many different levels at the same time, to know how to respond to your own suffering, how to anticipate and respond to the suffering of a single person, perhaps a decades-long friend, perhaps someone you're meeting for the first time at coffee hour, and to, to have a sense of their suffering, to be aware of the social justice uh, causes and the suffering that one's trying to alleviate in our nation and in our world. And that's part, so that's part of the challenge and it's part of the, the privilege that we have in this work, that capacity. To, to develop an ability to simultaneously know and pay attention to suffering at all of these different levels. The world needs us to bring our compassion to all of those different levels that we, that we can. It needs us to do so in an authentic way and to not step sort of beyond where we can bring that compassion in a genuine way. It needs us to go up to that point and to be consistently seeking ways to, to push that boundary and to know and bring uh, a greater degree of awareness of suffering and compassion to the world. I have a friend who illustrated this for me uh, pretty well about five years ago when I was in divinity school and we were driving uh, in July around Cambridge. We were going on Mass Ave past Cambridge common, and this is a friend who has sponsored ads in, uh, in like the New York Times and the Washington Post, national newspapers, ads that cost tens of thousands of dollars encouraging petitions that would change our, our political orientation in ways that would make this, the U.S. government a more compassionate entity that would expand on, on the broadest level pretty much that you can picture our collective capacity to understand and respond to suffering. And I had always sort of assumed and almost admired that in order to operate on this level, in order to be someone who had this much money and had this broad of an awareness about how we could respond to suffering in our world, he probably had to shut himself off from the, the tiny day-to-day -day sufferings going on in the world around him, that he must just kind of ignore the little things. So we were driving on Mass Ave, stopped at, a, at an intersection, and a person experiencing homelessness came walking past a whole bunch of cars towards us, holding a cardboard sign. And my friend was in the passenger seat, and he pulled out a dollar bill and handed it to me and motioned for me to roll down the window and give the dollar to this person experiencing homelessness. He said, it's a brutally hot day out there. He must really need the money if he's still out there and asking. And I could see in that moment that his expansive and expensive efforts at creating a politics of compassion in our world 
it was not something that he was able to do because he was cutting himself off from the day-to-day -day sufferings of the world. It was because he was able to extend a compassionate response to those small sufferings all the way out onto a much broader scale. That's what made him an effective and persistent responder to the sufferings in our nation and in our world. And so whoever you are, whatever path you are on and wherever you are on in that path, may your compassion grow and bloom and spread out into the world in all the ways that it can. Peace, salam, shalom, and may it be so.